Everybody, welcome to Kigali Council for Relations. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to say thank you for everybody for joining us. Secretary General of Communal Parliament Association, Honorable, thanks very much for joining us. So before we jump to the conversation, uh, I, I want to remember everybody two things. One, we're on the record for the first 20 minutes of the conversation. And then when you go to questions and the answer, we'll be off the record. And so please start sending your questions as we go through the conversations. We have a lot of people, so we're trying to get as many questions as possible. Uh, so, and then we can just, you know, jump into your questions. But without taking much, uh, Secretary General, thank you again for joining us. I'm, I'm very excited to see you, uh, you know, there's COVID happening, a lot of things happening to talk about, but uh, good to see you. Thanks for, for joining us. Thank you very much indeed, Yannick. It's a great pleasure. It is pouring with rain in London. I don't know what the weather's like there in Kigali. But... Uh, well, <laughs> no more rain. We can't. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm tired of wind and rain in all those elements. But so let's just jump a little bit in the questions. You know, uh, what what's the, what? Just help, help us understand what's the role of the Commonwealth Parliament Association, and and what what role the M MPs play in strengthening you know the Commonwealth family. Well, look, thanks, and it's great to have this opportunity to join you all today. Uh, the CPA, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, is celebrating our 110th anniversary. So we were established in 1911. And what we do is we bring together the parliaments and parliamentarians of the entire Commonwealth. So national parliaments, but also in those countries that have them, sub-national parliaments as well. Last week, we launched our strategic plan for the next uh, four years, seeking to address some of the big challenges. All that we do is about strengthening parliaments and parliamentarians so they can do their job properly, so they can be effective in legislating, holding the government to account, ensuring that budgets, uh, money is uh, raised for health, for education, for all of the other essential services. But the other element that's a bit newer in this strategy is a greater emphasis on Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals and the important yes. role that parliaments have in delivering the global goals. Yes, so that's that's very interesting because I was trying to see how is it connect to actually the challenges of today we're facing. So and, and and that's really good to hear. So a little bit, could you touch a little bit about what's your main programs or county? You just touched a little bit county project you're working on. That's great. So. Um, part of part of what we work on is giving a voice to parliamentarians across the Commonwealth. So we have an elected executive committee, which meets twice a year. I think we're going to come on to how we've adapted to the pandemic and to COVID, but normally those are physical meetings, but we've held two virtual meetings since I became the Secretary General last August. And in a normal year, we would have have a general assembly, Commonwealth Parliamentarians Conference, where everyone comes together to exchange good ideas. A big part of what we do is about mutual learning. How can we learn from each other? So this week, we are launching a brand new programme called the CPA Parliamentary Academy. And what this is, is an online suite of learning and development opportunities, so courses that are both for members of parliament elected, but also for parliamentary staff to exchange the very best practice. So we learn from each other on some of the big challenges like working as part of a committee, what you do in a budget process, how you ask questions of government ministers in a parliament. That's a big new programme that builds upon some of the existing work that we have. Another example of what we do is we have networks. So we have a network of small branches, which is about those branches that have populations under half a million. Yeah. Many of these are small island developing states, so they often are at the vanguard of our work on climate change and the environment, biodiversity. We have a very new network of parliamentarians with disabilities, raising some of the big issues around how People with disabilities are often excluded, face discrimination and stigma. And then we have our Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians Network, which is a very, very powerful voice for women's rights across our organisation. And of course, it only seems right uh, being with you in Rwanda to pay tribute to the excellent record that Rwanda has in the number of women parliamentarians in your parliament. And we hope that other members of the Commonwealth can aspire to achieve the same that Rwanda has achieved in that regard. So I just I just want to touch you just 
you just started your time as Secretary General. I'm very interested in what's your priorities and what you're trying to achieve uh, under uh, your leadership. Look, thank you. And I, it's probably worth me doing a sort of a short history of myself. So I was previously a parliamentarian uh, in the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, I served in a number of different roles. I was a member of government in education. And more recently, I chaired a cross-party committee of MPs on international uh, development. Uh, I also previously, when I wasn't in parliament, worked with the Aegis Trust, which is the organization that established the Kigali Genocide Memorial. So I had visited Rwanda on a number of occasions, most recently in 2014 for the Kwibuka uh, 20 uh, commemoration. It was a privilege to be with you there. One of the big things we're wanting to do is firstly to do more in partnership with others. So we can't do everything on our own. Let's work with others in the Commonwealth, but also outside of the Commonwealth. Secondly, we want to improve our communications. So our communications with our members, but also about what our members are doing in parliaments elsewhere. And as part of that, we've recently launched a new CPA podcast, uh, oh. Parliamentary Conversations in the Commonwealth. I'd encourage uh, those watching today to look at the first edition because it was about the aftermath of the Rwanda genocide, uh, Kwibuka 27, Remembrance and Genocide Prevention, uh, and we will have further podcasts in the months ahead. For me, I want us to be as effective as we can in supporting our members. That's the most important thing, supporting the parliamentarians, supporting the parliaments and the staff so they can do their job effectively, but then also for us to work with others on some of the big challenging issues like climate change, like good governance and democracy and human rights, issues to do with women's representation, but also things like health and education that are rightly come to the fore even more with the impact of the COVID pandemic. Yes, so I just want to touch something you mentioned. So how does the, you fit into the communal of national organization? Like how, how do you fit into this? So obviously the Commonwealth has its own secretariat yes. uh, based uh, in London and we have as our international headquarters, we're also based in London. In the kind of um, uh, technical terms of the Commonwealth, we are an accredited organisation. So we are accredited by the Commonwealth, but we are also an associated organisation, which gives us further um, access to the uh, workings of the Commonwealth. Look, we work really, really closely with the Commonwealth Secretariat. I was hoping to be in Kigali next month for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, and I very much aim and hope to be there whenever the Shogun is rearranged. We operate globally, but we also operate regionally. So our Africa regional headquarters is in Tanzania. And at a, at a regional level in Africa, there are very close relationships, obviously, with the African Union, but also with the United Nations that supplement some of the relationships that we have at a, an international level, both with the Commonwealth, but also with other multilateral organisations like the United Nations and the World Bank. Mm -hmm. Good. So uh, let's talk about COVID, the pandemic itself. Um, what role are you playing or MPs playing members? If you're playing, or should be playing with current pandemic uh, going on now? Look, Yannick, thank you. And I, I started this job in August of last year. So I started my new role in the midst of this global pandemic. And, you know, the first thing to say, because I think it's important to say, it, is that my thoughts are with all of those who've lost loved ones and indeed all of those who are living with COVID today, the health impact of this has been truly frightening. And we know that uh, there is still tragically uh, further, further suffering that will be, uh, that people will experience. And that is deeply, deeply sad. But I think for parliaments and for the CPA, there are some particular issues that we do need to address. Part of that is how parliaments have dealt with the pandemic itself. Governments have asked parliaments to pass emergency laws, to, uh, to take measures to protect public health. It reminds us that parliaments are central to the debates in countries. It reminds us that parliaments can also act as a check and a balance on governments if governments want to hold on to those emergency powers once the emergency period 
is over. But I think also it reminds me that parliamentarians aren't just about what happens in Parliament, mm -hmm. they're about what happens in the communities that they are elected to serve. Because often what parliamentarians can do is to provide local leadership, can provide reassurance to people. So for example, on vaccination, if there is hesitancy, as we know there is in countries across the world about the vaccine and its safety, one of the things parliamentarians can do is to provide that leadership and provide that reassurance. And we've seen that in Commonwealth countries right the way across all of the different continents that make up the Commonwealth. But then I think the other very important element is about what's going to happen next. Yes. And this phrase that's been used about building back better, because you know, we know that we live in a world that is incredibly unequal, where there is still great poverty uh, in communities in all parts of the world. We know that COVID has hit everyone, but it's hit some communities much harder than others. And yes. so as we look to the future, how can we make sure we learn the lessons from that so that we rebuild health systems and education systems and economies in ways that are truly fair and accessible to all and don't, that don't just reinforce some of the traditional divisions and inequalities that we know exist in all of the societies of the Commonwealth, including here in the United Kingdom where I am. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to touch a little bit back to, 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 to how do we turn this crisis to opportunities, but a little bit before we go to this, you know, if you look around, this COVID has forced us to fundamentally think nearly every aspect of our lives, institutions around the world. I was just watching the World Bank uh, uh, webinar a few weeks ago. They were talking about how this COVID is reshaping institutions like World Bank and other international organizations. So what impact this pandemic will have on the Commonwealth at large or, and within our family, in your views? So I think that there's a kind of, there's a, there's a technical aspect, which is quite important, yes. which is about how we work. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when I was a, a member of parliament, we would have debates about, you know, could we take witnesses at a committee meeting yes. that weren't in the room? Could we use the technology of Zoom and Microsoft Teams to take evidence? And we were, including me, we were always very wary and nervous of yes. would it work with the technology. And what we've seen this last year is a transformation yes. in how the technology can be used in order to widen uh, participation. Mm -hmm. And I think what's going to happen, we're already seeing this in parliaments across the Commonwealth and beyond the Commonwealth, is a debate about which elements of remote working and the use of virtual platforms might continue even when they're not necessary for reasons of public health versus where you might return much more to in-person meetings and in-person participation in debates. And there'll be different views about the right mix, but I certainly think, you know, the fact that I can join you today in the way that I am yeah. with an audience, as I understand it from, uh, not just from Rwanda, but other parts of East Africa and beyond is something that I would want us to be able to continue with uh, into uh, the future. So I think on the technical side, there are a lot of lessons that we can take forward as the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, the wider Commonwealth and the wider world. So how do we turn this pandemic into uh, opportunities? You just start talking about it a little bit, but when it's over, how do we turn this to a, an opportunity to move forward? So I think, I think there is a risk. Let me talk about the risk before the opportunity. You know, I think there is a real risk that when you've had uh, a public health crisis like this, mm -hmm. countries and communities might look inwards and think actually we need to, to focus on our own circumstances and be less connected with other parts of the world and less concerned about things that are happening in the other parts of the world. I think the, the other side of that coin, if you like, the opportunity as you've asked the question, is to recognize that we are incredibly interconnected. And what COVID reminds us, I mean, in, in some ways a tragic way, is that um, a, a virus like this can spread within countries and between countries, but also in a more positive way that we can learn from each other about the public health measures that have worked best. And ultimately, we can have vaccination available across the world. Now, clearly there is a huge issue around vaccine equity 
and the difference between the, the vaccination access that I have the privilege to enjoy here in the United Kingdom versus that in many, many other parts of the world, including in Africa. So addressing that question of vaccine equity, I think has to be a very, very high priority. The other thing I'd like to just emphasize is education, because we know looking at the sustainable development goals that achieving SDG four on access to high quality education was always going to be a huge job, a huge challenge for us. The pandemic, for obvious reasons, has made that even harder. And I hope that the world community, including the Commonwealth, can remember education as it remembers health in the debates going forward and get the resources in so that we can have children back in schools with high quality education moving forward. If we don't do that, there is a real risk of a kind of lost generation, to use um, a phrase that's often used, that has been impacted by this pandemic. And I think we owe it to ourselves, but particularly to children and young people, not to do that and to really focus on and invest in education as well as obviously on health going forward. That's very, very interesting points you made. Um, could go deep into this discussion about vaccination, medical, it's, it's something else. So my last question is, you know, if you look around what uh, the rising of anti-globalization, anti Brexit, you know, Trump, uh, or, or at, an, at a different trend, uh, what hope do you have in international corporations and organizations like yours and United Nations, you know, uh, Commonwealth? I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist, even when circumstances <laughs> make it challenging, even for the most optimistic of optimists. Yeah. Uh, and I, you're right to list a series of things that have that have happened that demonstrate that multilateral institutions don't always enjoy the respect and support that that they might. You know, the answer to that is quite complicated. It is partly about those institutions. And, and, and making sure that they are relevant and that they are seen to be responding to the concerns of citizens and communities. Now, there's a great um, political slogan uh, which says, think globally, act locally. It's an old slogan, but I think it's one of those that stands the test of time, uh, that actually a lot of these issues they, they will manifest themselves very differently in Rwanda as they might in the United Kingdom or as they might in India or in the United States. But actually there is a commonality in those um, uh, causes and the things that people care about. But delivering change has to start with people and where they live in their own communities, in their own countries, engaging with those people. And uh, that I think is where often, and I include myself in this, often the political class in countries hasn't always got it right. And you've seen then a disconnect between those in government, either nationally or internationally, and, and, and ordinary people, the citizens of a country. So getting that right, I think is essential. But we do also need to say, you know, the United Nations has many imperfections, but actually I, it, it's crucial that our United Nations institutions can succeed and work with others. And, and I'm very encouraged personally that the new administration, the Biden administration in the United States takes a much more engaged attitude with multilateral institutions like the UN. And final point on this is the Commonwealth, because I think what, what sets the Commonwealth apart really uh, from say the UN, you know, the UN has the Security Council and all of the challenges that brings in terms of the veto powers of the five permanent members. The Commonwealth doesn't work like that. The Commonwealth is a network that brings governments together, yes, but it also brings people together. It brings parliaments together in the way that the Commonwealth does. There is a chance to do a lot more sharing best practice, learning from each other. And that's why in the end, I really am optimistic that the Commonwealth itself can play a big part in this next phase after this awful pandemic, which is still with us, but from which I hope we really can rebuild better. Yeah, indeed, I hope we overcome this challenge this time. So uh, without taking much, let's uh, get questions from the audience. 
Good. All right. So this is all over time. Uh, uh, Honorable, thank you very much for a very interesting discussions and for answering our questions. Uh, it's always good to see you and uh, I hope everything goes better. We have program very soon some point. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's important in what you're doing with your organizations and I hope to see, uh, you know, strengthening our Commonwealth family as we, as we move forward. Look, Yannick, thank you. And if I might say, I really do look forward to being back in Kigali at some point, and perhaps there might be an opportunity to come yes. and meet you all in person uh, yes. in Kigali. We'll be very happy to host you for a conversation in person, absolutely. All right, thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Thank you Bye -bye. for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.